It is on now. And make sure that we're hitting that record button there in the back. Welcome. This week was a landmark week in our nation for unborn children. And it is my sincere prayer that states follow up on that and that we once again take back unborn children, that we give them the value that God gives them, and that uh, for those who are dismayed and hurting and upset, that we can show them love and kindness uh, as they think, uh, feel, believe that their civil rights are being violated in this. Um, it is a touchy subject to say the least when we talk about Roe versus Wade, when we talk about legalized abortion, but I am persuaded that our country took a step in the right direction this week. I wanna give God the glory for that. And may he see that as a sign that we are headed in the right direction. May it be a step in the right direction for us as a nation. We're gonna be taking our topic this week from Romans chapter eight. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn over there. This again is our core 52. We'll follow up again Wednesday night uh, in our class. I believe Jan has class this week and what a wonderful chapter. Is that right? What a wonderful chapter to, uh, to, uh, to continue to study. Romans chapter eight is, it, it comes in with no condemnation. It ends with no separation. And in between you find no defeat. It's one of those greatest chapters in, 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 the, in a book of great chapters. In, a, in a, the Roman letter, it's a book of great chapters. In the Bible, a, a, a complete collection of great chapters. And our topic is freedom. And a preacher relates the story about holding a series of meetings for some college-age students. And the topics ranged across the spectrum. Doctrine, hell, dating. But each conversation, they had a couple of rules. You have to be honest. You have to be gracious. Be honest with what you're saying and be gracious to the honesty that people are sharing with you as well. And on one particular night, the students wanted to discuss habitual sin. And although they all struggled with a variety of sinful behaviors, they all agreed on one thing. God is extremely disappointed with me. One student said, my parents were students at a Christian college in the early 90s when a revival broke out. They were on fire for God, and here I am, consumed by sin day after day. And often through tears, many of the students shared similar stories about how they believed God was disappointed with them. And after listening to their stories, the preacher said, how many of you were raised in a Christian home? Hands went up across the room. How many of you went to a Bible-based church? Hands stayed up. And yet, they all thought and agreed that God was extremely disappointed with them. Maybe you can relate. And so I want to ask a question. What can God do for sinners like us who are fighting but too often failing? He says, I am tired. I am weary, etched in the background there. I am fighting. But I am failing. What does God think of you today? Oh, not the, the cleaned up airbrushed version of yourself, not the studio picture version of yourself. Do you ask yourself, is God disappointed in me? Do I look awful to God? And I think maybe the reality is that all of us have asked this, ourselves that question once in our lifetime, we may be asking ourselves that question now. Do you feel or think that God is disappointed in you? Well, to answer that question, I want to look at this awesome chapter, Romans chapter 8. It's such an important passage here in chapter 8, verse 1. There's there 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Ray Ortland Jr. says this, Paul's letter to the Romans has the potential to transform the church in our generation, just as it has transformed generations in the past. And I agree. We find the most, one of the most powerful presentations of the gospel message here in the book of Romans. A gospel message of what God has done in Jesus, through Jesus, to make things right for us with God. And Paul begins chapter 8 with the very dilemma that we're talking about. What can God do for sinners like us who are fighting but too often failing? But in order to look at chapter 8, verse 1, you have to understand that that chapter break should not be there. Chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, actually the first four or five verses there, should go back into chapter 7. They shouldn't be there. So let's read chapter 7 verses 15 through 23, and we'll pick up a little bit of the nuance of what Paul is talking about here and why he begins what we call chapter 8 with, therefore, there is now no condemnation. Beginning in chapter 7, verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, and, and trust me, I could have begun at chapter 1, verse 1, in order to get to chapter 7, in order to try to explain all this, but let's pick this thought up here in chapter 7. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am un spiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living inside of me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living, me, living in me that does it. So I find this at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. There's a ton of debate about what Paul is talking about here. Is he talking about his experience before he was a Christian? Is he talking about his experience as a Christian? Is he talking about Israel's experience with God in their history? Perhaps all three. But to some extent, I'm persuaded that Paul gives voice to the things that I feel and think just about every day. And I think most Christians do as well. Anyone who has seriously followed Christ has known something of wanting to obey Christ. Feeling frustrated, feeling like a failure. We want to do good, but we end up doing the very thing we didn't want to do. We want to please God, but the power to do so seems to be out of our grasp. I can relate to that, even this morning. And given this struggle, Paul gives us two things here as we transition into what we'll call out of chapter 7 into chapter 8. Paul says this, he says, wretched man that I am, what must I do? No, that's not what he says. Read that again. That's not what he says. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? You see, the answer to our fighting and failing, who will deliver us, the answer comes from outside of us. And that answer, Paul tells us, is Jesus. Thanks be to God, in verse 25, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who will deliver me? The answer comes from outside of us. It is Jesus. When we come to the end of ourselves and realize that we need Christ, 
when we arrive there, we're in a very good position indeed. We're exactly where we need to be. If you feel like you don't measure up, then the answer isn't to try harder. I'll do better. I'll be better. The answer is to look outside yourself to Jesus and all that he brings. He says here in verse 25, I think our conundrum, if it, is it, if it were, thanks be to God, excuse me, verse 24, what a wretched mind man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ my Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. He's saying that there's a war going on inside of me. There's a war going on inside of the Christian. My mind says, I want to do what God wants me to do. My body isn't following. My flesh, my sinful nature keeps wanting to do what I want to do. And there's a war. And so how do I address that? How do I address the fighting, the exhaustion, the failing, the, the, the confusion that comes with that? How do I fight those things? I take what Paul says in these next verses. Very seriously, he says, understand, because of what Jesus has done, because Jesus delivers us from that sinful nature, because Jesus delivers us from the sin that causes death, he says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. I've always taken that passage apart from chapter 7. There's there for now no condemnation. I've always looked at it as a salvation from death to sin, and I still believe that. But within the context of chapter 7, I believe it also lifts a burden, an undue burden that I put on myself. Perhaps you do as well. An unholy burden off of my shoulders. What can God do for sinners like us, fighting but too often failing? He removes the condemnation. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? It doesn't mean that God is disappointed in you because you struggle. No. God's not disappointed in you because you struggle. Is He disappointed in you that you fight and fail? No, He's not. He's provided a Savior, and He's removed condemnation. That word, it's important to understand condemnation. It's one of those words that is a law word. If you read the book of, of Romans, the letter of Romans, as a lawyer reads it, Kirk, I can't imagine what goes through your mind when you read this book, how it's laid out. I was reading uh, sermon and commentary after commentary after sermon yesterday that was describing the letter of Romans as a, a legal document, a legal representation, legal presentation to the people. You see, Rome was the center of the universe during Paul's day, and he would have a court there, which we would basically call the Supreme Court. And the people of Rome were educated. They had this thing called the Table of Twelve that sat out in, in this area where the judicial system took place. And on those 12 tables was a, a bronze covering, and on those bronze coverings, what etched into it were the laws of the Romans. And it was your duty, it was your responsibility as a Roman citizen to go and, and familiarize yourself with those laws. As a matter of fact, they loved doing that. Free man, slave, those who rested in the Senate, those who made bread for a living. Everyone in Rome wanted to know what was on that table. They were educated. They were judiciously or judicially educated. They were educated in the law. They understood that word condemnation. It carries with it something about debt and penalty. Paul says there's no condemnation. There's no debt. There's no penalty now because God removes it all. Paul will argue back over in Romans chapter 3, what we call Romans chapter 3. He says this, is a, this applies to everybody. He's a lawyer standing up in court saying to the judge, this applies to everybody. 
There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 23 Verse 22, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As a lawyer, he's standing up talking to the judge and the judge being God, he's saying, God, there is nobody who is righteous. Everyone has broken your law. Roman people would understand that. The Jew and the Gentile have broken God's law. But Paul says there's no longer a debt. There's no longer a penalty. Those who would stand up in court and accuse you, you have been acquitted. It's ruled in your favor. You have no debt. There's no penalty against you. You are no longer under condemnation. Now, I have always looked at that as a penalty of, of sin and death. When I sin, I die. But in the context of chapter 7, he's saying when you struggle and you beat yourself up and you doubt yourself, when you're fighting and you can't consider in one moment if I'm saved, if I'm not saved, if I'm saved, if I'm saved, if I'm not saved, going back and forth, I confess my sins, I'm not condemned. I sin again, now I'm condemned. I confess my sins, I'm not condemned. That battle that rages, he says, it's over. Just trust God. The work of Jesus Christ that he says in chapter 7, and again reiterates in chapter 8, the work that Jesus has done abolishes that. Be confident in Jesus Christ. Be confident in your salvation. Don't let that weigh on you. And who does that apply to? He says, those who are in Christ Jesus. It's for sinners that are in Christ Jesus. And what does he mean by being in Christ Jesus? He goes back to Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And he says this, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Sinners who have been baptized into Christ Jesus are now under no condemnation. They no longer have a debt to pay. They no longer have a penalty to pay. Does that apply to our salvation? It absolutely does. But in the context of that struggle, that daily, I, I, I don't want to do these things, but I keep doing them. Why is it I don't do the things I want to do? In that daily struggle, in that daily fight, Paul says, get rid of that. It's been eradicated. It's over. When we are in Christ Jesus, it changes everything. To be in Christ means that we are in an actual relationship with our Lord and Savior. And when it's all the benefits of His life, all the benefits of His obedience are ours because we're united with Him. We share in His victory. My oldest son played on a championship winning team. I was the coach. I didn't make one single play. I wasn't out there hammering against any of those other kids. I wasn't there on the practice field. I wasn't the one wearing the pads and the helmets. I wasn't the one who was doing all that stuff. He was. But when we won that championship, when he won that championship, I was a part of it. I gained victory through his actions. You gained victory through the actions of Jesus Christ. Paul says we're united with Christ. And there's no longer condemnation for us. 
And some of us think, well, maybe that just applies to our future self in heaven. The verb tense that Paul uses says it's present tense. It's now. These things are now. It's not later when you get your act together. It's not in the middle of the struggle. It's not when you get older. It's not when you get mature. It's not when you overcome a certain habit or sinful habit. It's not when we get past being hurt by others. It's not when all of our bills are paid. It's not when we get a new job. It's not when we learn more of the Bible. It's not when people start treating us nicely and with respect. It's not when we get praise and public adulation that we think we deserve. It's not when our enemies stop persecuting us. It's not when the wrongs against us have been put right. It's not when we're vindicated. It's not when we stop making fools of ourselves in public. It's now. It's now the very moment that you believe in Jesus Christ. It occurred at that moment and continues now in your failing and in your fighting, there's no condemnation. Doesn't that make you feel good? It's a shame that people who were raised in the church, it's a shame that anyone who has come to know the grace and mercy and salvation of Jesus Christ would continue to beat themselves up over those things. I don't want to sin. And I'm not saying, well, I sin, forget about it. There's nothing I can do. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, stop laying awake till three or four o'clock in the morning thinking about the sins that you've committed during that day to keep you awake going, my God, why can't, why can't I be better? Stop hounding yourself for your sin. Don't disregard it. Again, don't, don't take it lightly. Try not to do it. Work diligently not to be a sinner. Work diligently to overcome those things. Trust in the Lord because you see the Lord gave us things. You know, in the book in, in, in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit itself is mentioned no fewer than 19 times. The most in any chapter in the Bible. 19 times the Spirit is there. Do you think it might be important Paul is saying, rely on the Spirit of God to help you overcome, to help you understand that there's no condemnation, to help you understand that you are victorious, that you are more than conquerors, to help you understand that nothing can separate you from the love of God. I saw a Facebook post uh, this week online. I don't do Facebook. I saw that somebody had copied it and put it online. It said, list of things that can separate you from God's love was the heading, and underneath it was blank. Nothing. There's nothing that can separate you from His love. Not your sin, not your guilt, not even if you're lost and haven't named Jesus as your Savior. That doesn't separate you from His love. It separates you from His blessings. It separates you from salvation. But it never separates you from His love. Paul will say, there is neither height. What does he say at the end of the chapter? We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm convinced there's neither death nor life, angels or demons, present, future, any powers, height nor depth, nor anything else in creation that would be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I got news for you, brothers and sisters. I am not perfect. I know you think I am. I know y'all go to bed at night going, man, that Dave is such a perfect guy. I am so glad that he's here with us. He is so perfect. I am not. I struggle with sin as much as anybody, maybe more than anybody. And I wrestle with my pride. I wrestle with my inner self, constantly badgering and beating myself up because I can not seem to let go of the sin that, that so entangles and snares me. And it's the same sins that I've been struggling with since I was 12 or 13 years old. 42 years. 
you'd think I'd get it right by now, especially that I've got, now that I've got God on my side, God working inside of me, I'm supposed to be perfect, right? I'm not, and you're not. So today, I want you to do this for me. At the bottom of your handout, I don't know if you all got handouts or not. At the bottom of your handout, it says this, there is now no condemnation for, and I want you to write your name in there. I want you to put your name in that line. Fill in your name and then live out that reality. Let go of that burden. It's not yours to carry. Let go of that, that, that exhaustion. Let go of that frustration. Let go of that fighting. Let go of that weariness. Be confident. Know it. Then you're every fiber of your being, allow the Holy Spirit to work and grow in you to convince you I'm not condemned. I'm not condemned of sin and I'm not condemned because I fight and I struggle. I have freedom. I have freedom to live my life to its fullest. I have freedom to live my life in servitude. And that's what it does. It, it frees us to serve. It frees us to serve. What matters is not how much you accomplish for God. What matters is how much God loves you. It doesn't matter what you do to make your life more secure, better jobs better houses, better clothes, better education. What matters is that you are secure in Jesus Christ. It's your confidence. It's your peace. It comes from God alone. We have been set free. Paul tells us in Galatians, it was freedom that God has set you free. Freedom. Freedom to experience joy. Freedom to experience fulfillment. Freedom to experience an anxiety-free life. Freedom to, from depression. Freedom from anger. Freedom from lust, freedom from filthy language, freedom from the sins that weigh you down. You've been delivered from that. Hold your head up high. Walk confidently in the work that God has done. And serve others by sharing that message with them. There is now no condemnation. Read it with me. It's gone from our board. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who are those in Christ Jesus? Me. Sonia. Laura. They are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because... Through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. Enjoy your freedom. Relish your freedom. Share that with as many as you possibly can. Tell them that there is freedom in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be free from the debt. Be free from the penalty. There are about a, a zillion other things that we could look at in, in Romans chapter 8, but that's all the time we have for this morning. So I want to invite you, if you have not given your life to Christ and been set free from your sins, or perhaps you're struggling with that fight and that failure that's beating you up. There's a, 
There's a kid's song called Let It Go. Let it go. I know we can't use that as an invitation song, and that's okay. But let that burden, that undo and unholy burden, let it go. Enjoy your freedom in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Mike, have you got a song for us, brother?